I have a phrase. Uh, my phrase is technology fails until it succeeds. The point is, what will you as an individual choose to use as your technology to avoid starving to death or freezing to death economically? That's the question. So the mobile wave was software leaping off of the desktop and out of the office and into the world of the teenager and on a Saturday afternoon. And that's what made for a Facebook or an Amazon uh, mobile, you know, or Google or YouTube, you know, and laid the, laid the framework for entertainment and, and communications. Now we're moving on to the virtual wave. You're seeing the virtualization of a whole class of products and services that previously were delivered uh, by human beings. You can zoom anywhere at the speed of light and bend time and space. If I'm a salesperson, I can take 40 sales calls a week if I want in 40 different cities. But the other profound part of it is what you just did when we started our call, which is you punched the record button and you and I are having a meeting cross country and that's about to be shared with thousands or hundreds of thousands of people anywhere, anytime, three years from now, someone will be able to go back in time three years and be in the room with us now for the cost of the electricity. We're watching the virtualization of money. So I can tell you that gold that I have, and if this were a real Nobel Prize, it would be worth about $24,000. And, uh, and that gold came from the collision of two enormous neutron stars. And that happened perhaps 5 billion years ago in our region of the galaxy. And the neutron enrichment, basically a giant atom, not of 56 neutron, but 10 to the 56 neutrons or something like that coming together, the shrapnel of which produced the gold uh, that we find. Now you're saying we're only gonna have, you know, 21 million coins that are subdivided into so many Satoshis or what Bitcoin. But I don't think there's gonna be another neutron star that, uh, put it this way, if another neutron star collides near the earth, we've got much bigger problems in our monetary situation. But, you know, the fact is that's much more scarce than a, a, you know, my friend down the street mines Bitcoin. Uh, in other words, how can we be so certain <clears throat> that it is, it has this permanence and it has this durability and resilience that it makes it a true store of money the way that these neutron stars did for us many billions of years ago? Um, the history of money is is human beings looking for some for some system that they can use to store and trade value both with each other and with themselves over time. With some commodities, they're really easy to produce. The hardest commodity to produce that also had the characteristics that we wanted for money was gold. I mean, because we needed it to be durable and stable, like it needs to it needs to last a thousand years. We mine gold. Gold miners produce about two percent more gold every year. That means that if I took all of all of the money in the world and I bought gold with it, and I had a hundred percent of the gold in the world, a hundred years from now, I would have twelve and a half percent of the gold in the world. Gold is centralized, which means uh, you can hypothecate it and you can sell it short. Uh, there's no way for you to be sure that the bank that holds all your gold didn't uh, actually sell the gold twice without telling you uh, because you can't reasonably withdraw $100 million of gold and store it underneath your mattress. But And so that means that uh, gold has always been plagued uh, by people issuing notes against the gold without enough gold to cover it. If you look at something like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is audited every 10 minutes by 10,000 nodes, so it's very, it's very challenging and not impossible to lie about it. Those 100 million people can take personal custody if they want because it has no mass. But what's to prevent, you know, a really black swan event, as Taleb would say, from, you know, government just saying, You're, this is now illegal, and any proceeds, we want to know the history of every single coin. A lot of people are working very hard to come up with some reason why they shouldn't trust a new thing. Meanwhile, it's quite clear that 7.8 billion people on the planet have a problem. Everybody with money on earth 
is going to lose half their wealth in the next 48 months if they do nothing. If you live, if you're one of the billion people in a collapsing developed economy, you're going to lose everything if you do nothing. The solution is a digital monetary network that doesn't dissipate energy that you can access where, where no one can corrupt it and you can take personal custody of your money, of your monetary energy. The laws of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy, right? What's at the core of Bitcoin is the laws of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy. If I put a million dollars of monetary energy into the network in the year 2020, I can go forward 250 years or 50 years or 10 years or whatever amount of time frame you want. And I will have the same amount of monetary energy scaled up perfectly linearly, you know, for the economic growth without any individual stealing it all. Mm -hmm. If you take the same amount of monetary energy and you put it into the dollar, you will lose 99% of that energy. It will be stolen from you by the central bank and the fractional reserve bankers over the course of 100 years, maybe over the course of 10 to 15 years. When you live in the universe, you have to subject yourself to the laws of thermodynamics. You don't get to create energy or destroy energy or create mass or destroy. There's a conservation of this stuff. You can't leap a million gazillion miles. We don't have a world where you get to leap a million miles an hour and murder everybody and the guy next to you doesn't, right? You're both subject to the same laws of thermodynamics in that world. But in the world of fiat, there's one dude that can steal the life work of a billion people in a minute on a whim. And there's another person that can't. So the significance of Bitcoin is you can take a, a portion of monetary energy, you can store it on a network that no politician, no bank, no counterparty can seize from you against your will and nobody can debase or inflate away via some uh, some political edict, which is not the case with any other monetary system on earth. What is the purpose of wealth to you? Money is monetary energy. Monetary energy is the apex of all energies. Wealth is just uh, energy and you can channel it however you want and it ultimately it gets channeled based upon the values of the people with the energy, right? For listeners that ask me, you know, how can I talk to people that have so much power, the ability to convert energy and do work in a very brief amount of time? Those obviously you're not going to co construct a mercenary army, I hope, you know, with with some of your money. But um, it's not on my agenda. It would be a bad investment anyway. <laughs> you can have more energy, you can have more money, but we're also living in the most polarized, you know, discrepancy between those that can apply energy per, in the shortest amount of time and those that cannot. Um, how how do you does that affect you? Do you think about that? If I have. 25 trillion dollars of currency floating around and i just print another trillion i just seized four percent of all the power in the civilization and i just did it by fiat right by edict without even a law being passed right so so the biggest power discrepancy is is the current uh, power to print money currency and that leads to all the other power discrepancies and if you want to reverse that then you need you need to educate the world so that people understand that they should switch from the fiat standard to the Bitcoin standard. Because if you're on the Bitcoin standard, nobody could print more Bitcoin and deprive you of your monetary energy. The swimming pool won't work, the airplane won't fly, the ship won't sail, the electrical system won't work with the short circuit, the pneumatic system won't work with a leak in it. You know, nothing works in the engineering world if you don't have, you know, integrity and a closed system. And nothing works in math if you just change the number, right? I mean, the point is math is math. So if you want to reject all of math, all of thermodynamics, all of science, the conservation of energy and the universe, then yeah. 
you can run your society based upon fiat currency with one individual that makes up however much money they want to make up at any given time. But it seems pretty clear that the rest of the universe doesn't work that way. What does it mean to talk about the thermodynamics of Bitcoin or anything in particular when it comes to computation or storage of information? I'm going to give a quick overview of a physicist view of such a process and take you through an exercise in the calculation of what thermodynamics really is all about, which is entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder, of chaos, of ignorance, of lack of information or clutter in a system. And it's often talked about in computer context, and especially in the application of computers by Michael Saylor in the video you just saw, in the context of how easy, how simple, how thermodynamically sound such currency is. And we're going to consider the most basic process in computing, which is the act of forgetting, which is the act of erasing. And the question is, when you erase information, how much energy is required to conduct that process in a computer? How would you actually do it? Well, you can bound how much uh, would need to be done by considering the changing of every single bit of information stored in a computer uh, in a byte of information, in a gigabyte of information. Uh, computers use, uh, in the context of Bitcoin, they use uh, 256 bits for encrypting uh, certain aspects of the ledger, uh, the blockchain. So I'm going to use the example of looking at the erasing of a of an amount of memory known as a gigabyte. So a gigabyte is 1,024 megabytes. A megabyte is 1,024 kilobytes. And a kilobyte is 1,024 bytes. Now, what is a byte? A byte is eight bits. So that could be represented by eight light bulbs, you know, where the light bulbs could either be on or off. It could be represented in computer memory by zeros and ones, zero volts, five volts, etc. And so that's how we represent computers, represent memory. First question is, if your computer erates and overwrites over all that uh, one gigabyte worth of memory and keeps no record of the information that was stored, I want to ask the question of how much process, what, what, how much in that process, how much entropy is created? Second law of thermodynamics that Michael Saylor refers to is always about this law that entropy can never decrease. So entropy, we'll be re representing it mathematically in this uh, short little conversation. And the question is, once you have that much entropy and you've now dumped it into the larger system of the room in which the computer is sitting, how much heat, how much thermal energy is associated with that? Is it a large amount of heat? Is it a small amount of heat? And then you imagine how much uh, memory, how many times this is done every second on the blockchain. The question is, how much and energy does this actually take? And so entropy, if we regard uh, the calculation of entropy, we note that there are, if there are n bits, uh, which is a slot, you can think of it as a slot or a placeholder and a transistor, and each one can take on a value high or low, uh, zero or one, then you actually have two states for each uh, for each bit, so you have two to the n possible different states. So we can convert a gigabyte into a megabyte and then a megabyte into a kilobyte etc and then eventually we convert the number of bytes into bits and we've got uh, 2 to the 10th times 2 to the 10th times 2 to the 10th times 2 to the third and if you calculate that at home you get 2 to the 33rd power uh, bits of information so that is a total amount of bits represented in one gigabyte now, it could either be in one of two states, a zero or a one. So that means if you have n bits, that's two to the n different states that are possible in calculating the total available amount of, of, uh, of entropy. That means that the number of states there are is two to the two to the 33rd power. It turns out that entropy usually involves the calculation of very large numbers. And so to simplify the large numbers, uh, we uh, realized since the time of Boltzmann that the entropy is most conveniently expressed in terms of a logarithm of the number of states. So the exact expression that Boltzmann has on his tombstone is that uh, it relates the amount of entropy times his famous constant K, and we get an entropy of 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules per Kelvin. A joule is a relatively small number too. 
But we said we're doing this uh, this calculation. All the computers that do uh, operate on Bitcoin, they do it at room temperature. And so the room temperature, we'd multiply by 300, and we still don't get a very large number. We're getting something that is going to be a very, very tiny amount in temperature uh, of additional temperature that's added to the to the world, or additional heat rather that's added to the world in terms of joules. We get uh, by multiplying this increase in entropy, this eight times 10 to the minus 14th joules per Kelvin times room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. We get an, an almost infinitesimal or microscopic amount of energy, uh, which is equal to uh, the amount of, of heat that will be dumped into the environment. And we get an answer that's about 2.4 times 10 to the minus 11th joules. Now, is that a big number or is that a small number? Turns out it's a small number. But again, we only consider the multiplication of these bits or changing of these bits from zeros to ones for one gigabyte worth of memory in a computer at room temperature. So that's a small amount of energy required for a gigabyte. But if you imagine terabytes, which are thousands of gigabytes or, or thousands of thousands of terabytes uh, uh, that could be conceivable for a supercomputer farm that's operating perhaps at a Bitcoin farm, you could get many, many joules per second or per however often the Bitcoin, the blockchain is up updated. So it's it could be that it is not insignificant, but I did want to only illuminate from a physics point of view, where are these operations coming into play? What is actually causing the increase in energy or requiring energy? It's actually a process related in thermodynamics to the entropy of both creation or storage of information and not destruction of information. We physicists don't believe that's possible. There is some trace of the, of the process that was used to erase that could in principle be used in a reversible process to recover the information, but you could never rec recover that heat. That heat is lost forever to the universe and can no longer be recovered to do anything useful, such as writing new information or producing matter and antimatter in pairs, for example. Uh, so it is a process and under which is governed by the laws of thermodynamics.